ever been lied to before? Raise your hand. Anybody just enjoy being lied to? Anybody? Yeah, Eddie's just weird like that. Nobody likes being lied to. Absolutely, I hate being lied to. I tell, the, I tell people all the time when I'm doing pastoral counseling or whatever, it's like, just tell me the truth no matter, no matter what. No matter what, just tell me the truth. I can deal with the truth. But if you lie to me, you go from credibility to like zero. I don't, like for real zero. How do you know, ladies and gentlemen, if I have not been lying to you over the last 10 years or nine years that Catalyst Church have been in existence? How do you know? Read the Bible. There you go. There's where we're going. Because here's the deal. It's a very high possibility, it's not, that I've been lying to you and misleading you the entire time. I have been, could it have been, do I have the power, if you want to say, with a microphone strapped to my back and my beautiful hot body to be able to change your mindset regarding the Bible and, to, and who Jesus is? The answer is yes. And there's been many people that have fallen into the trap of believing whatever he or she would want to because they do not go for the truth. They do not, they desire the truth, but culture, people, churches, pastors have been misleading us potentially the entire time. How do you know what is the truth? And we see this all over Facebook nowadays. Somebody just posts something and it's like, whether it's mask or politics or whatever, they post something and it's like, see, masks don't work or see, masks do work or see the government this, see the government this. And it's like a clip or a picture from like 10 years ago or something like this, but they put it for its truth for today. Nobody facts checks it. From the bottom of my heart, I'm going to say this. I'm going to, I am want you to hear me loud and clear. Please check everything I say. From this point on, and I've said this before, check everything I say with God's Word. Because I might wake up, and I might not feel good, and I might just preach some heresy to you. Your job is not just be little sheep, as that coin term is happening around the world. Don't be my sheep. Be Jesus' sheep. Because if you're Jesus' sheep, You're going to hear his voice, and you're going to hear his voice loud and clear. Fat check everything I say. And I'll say this honestly. If you come to me after you have fact checked it with God's word, not that you come to me, well, I don't think. If you come to me with, I think, I'm going to shove in your face your think and say, don't think, prove it. Prove it with God's word. Now, if you come to me and say, This is what God's word said. You completely took it out of context. You were wrong. I will be the first person that will stand up on this stage and says, man, you know what? I didn't preach what is right. And thank you, whatever, Jason, for for helping me. Now, I was like, woo, it's going to like, let's nail Dave to the cross. Hey, nail me to the cross because I'm an infallible person or I'm a fallible person worshiping a perfect God. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. Listen, I will mess up. It's not my goal. Your job is to not believe anything I say until you've proven it according to the word of God. Is that a good deal? Now, with that being said is I challenge you to do it to anything and everything you come in contact with, especially dealing with dealing with your spirituality and definitely dealing with your holiness with God. That's my challenge. It's my challenge for myself, my challenge to you. God, as we discuss this, first, this third church called Pergamum, I do pray that I, in my faulty lips, will be able to preach this perfect holy truth found in your perfect holy word. I do pray that you'll help me, but more importantly, I pray that the, the Spirit of God will just move in our hearts And may we understand that it's a very high possibility that we have been misled by the culture. We've been misled by the media. We've been misled by pastors. We've been misled all throughout our life, maybe starting in Sunday school. Because we have not checked the truth. And Jesus, you says that you are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. No one comes to the Father except through you. So may we check you. 
as truth above all truth. I pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. All right, here we go. Revelation chapter 2. Turn to your Bibles. If you do not have your Bibles, there's your first problem. I don't even have to preach anything else. If you don't have a Bible, oh, there you go. Pull out your cell phones. It's on the Bible app, whatever. Download the app. Um, download it. Download it. If you come to Catalyst Church without the Bible, we are going to put some verses up on the screen, not all of them. So how do you know what I'm reading is actually from the Bible? Oh, bring your what? Bible. Here we go. So here's the, here's the synopsis of so far in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, we are all excited about the book of Revelation. Why? Because there's this dragon, there's the Antichrist, there's fire from heaven, there's, there's, a, there's tons of cool stuff from chapter 4 onward. And everybody loves the book of Revelation because those are the, uh, that, that tickles our spider senses of, woo, I want to learn. But until we understand what chapters 1, 2, and 3 are all about, we're going to take the Bible and Revelation completely out of context. This book, Revelation, was given to us by John's writing, but through the inspiration of Jesus himself. Jesus said, write these words down and send these words to seven churches. These seven churches are not included with Catalyst Church. They are seven real churches. Now, we can learn what Jesus is saying to these churches, and that's why we're studying it. We can learn and grow so we don't make the same mistakes that these seven churches are. So we can't just say, all this information is just for me. No, it's specifically in context. We're going to be talking about that in much depth. It starts with a first church, and this is, this is the map um, of, of all the churches. We started with, from the island of Patmos, John got the vision from Jesus, and then he wrote to Ephesus, Smyrna, now Pergamum, and we're going to continue to go, and then you're going to get what you want. You're going to get the end time stuff, that everything that you probably have been waiting for, but we have to know this in context. The church for today is Pergamum. Everybody say Pergamum. Pergamum. Here we go. This is what Jesus says to the church in Pergamum, verse 12 in chapter 2. It says this, and to the angel in the church of Pergamum write the words of him who is the sharp two-edged what? Sword. Sword. I know where you dwell, where whose throne is? Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast to my name, and you do not deny my faith. He's like, attaboy, great job. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, which, by the way, in this, nobody really knows who Antipas is. No theologians, no historians have ever heard of Antipas except for this, other than we know that he was killed among you where Satan dwelt. But I... Jesus, have a few things against you. You have, what's the next word? You have what? Some. some. What's the word? You have what? Some. some there, some people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam. We'll talk about that in a second. Who taught Balak to stum a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual what? Immorality. Verse 15. So also you have some, you have what? Some. some among you who hold to the teachings of the who? Nicolaitans. All right. Therefore, what's the next word? Repent. repent. Therefore, repent. Because if not, I will come to you soon and war. I don't know about you, but if God says he's going to war against us, we better repent and get back to where we need to be. War against them with the sword of my mouth, which is ultimately the word of God. He who has the ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on it, on the stone that no one knows except for the one who receives it. Okay, I'm going to pause on verse 17, and we're going to go back. Verse 17 let me give you some insight. Nobody knows really what this hidden manna is and what the name is on the white stone. Why? Because it's hidden and secret. I've told you this from the very beginning. If I am not confident in something, I'm not going to add something to Revelation, and I'm not going to take anything away from it. So verse 17, 
You want the answer to, to this? The answer is, what do you think? I don't know. Okay, that's verse 17. Here you go, verse 12. <laughs> it says, to the church in Pergamum write. So what is the church in Pergamum? This is very important for us to understand. And what it does it have to talk about Satan's throne? Here we go. This is very important. There's roughly about 120,000 people that were, were in Pergamum. It was actually the capital of Asia Minor for about 300 years. It's a very influential city. Massive construction projects happened throughout the city. Just imagine walking into this city, like, like um, let's say, New York City. How many of you guys have ever been to New York City before? Two people. Okay. So you walk into New York City, so I guess, and you walk in and you're like, whoa, look at all this stuff. That's what Romans wanted. Romans wanted to show their power through structure and intellect and emperor worship. So if somebody would walk into Pergamum, they'd be like, whoa, look at the amphitheater. Look at the massive temples. Look at the huge structures and, and so on and so forth. In fact, the second largest library in the entire world was there in Pergamum, other than Alexander's um, library, as you historians might know. They were all about emperor wor worship, all about emperor worship. In other words, whoever was on the throne made the rules, and not only like worship, but bowed down and worship the emperor. There are four major temples of the little g god in mythology. We're going to look at two for a brief second. But before we do, there was mythology. Mythology is the practice or the belief that there were these mystic, mystical creatures called gods. And these gods were the powers that keep the universe in existence, the war of different gods. But there were some gods for, in, in fact, that in, in, in this city, they really deified. They worshiped these in major ways. The first one is this. Escapisopsis. Okay. You can figure out what that says. My wife comes up to my office. It's explicitis. And I'm like, sounds good to you, but I can't say it. Okay. So that's the God. Ultimately, it's the little G God of healing. There were lavish spas that people can go into in the temple and be healed from ailments. Um, there are huge healing centers or, or places with inside the Roman emperor, empire that they would come to, um, to this city to be able to get healed. In fact, if you needed healing, you could go into this God of healing temple, and it was a temple filled with snakes. Everybody love this story already, filled with snakes. Anybody love snakes? All right, there's the door. You can, it's just like, oh, by the way, for an illustration, there's like three snakes that I let go in, in, in the room. So I'm just joking, golly. Okay, all right, but watch this. In order to get healing, you could either go to the spa or you could pay enough money to spend the night in the temple. And if you spend a night in the temple, according to the gods, you would have to lie perfectly still in the middle of the night. And if the god would say, you know what, I will give you healing, the snakes would start crawling all over you in the middle of the night, but you could not move. I don't know about you, but first off, I would not go. Second of all, if a snake touched me, they would have to clean up a puddle afterwards to pee in my pants. I don't know, all right? But here's the deal. The, the truth of the matter is that they were trying to find ways for healing in this, in this temple. Now, here's an interesting thing. And this is the purpose of, first off, what was Satan called in, the, in Genesis? A serpent. So we're about to see here the, the throne room or the, where Satan lives. So right here we can think that it's a potential possibility that Jesus was saying that this throne, this throne room where Satan lives is because of this little G God here. We're going to get to the second one in a second. But this is what he looked like. This is the God. And he had a pole with a what on it? Snake on it. This is what the image of worship was. Now pause. Back away from the screen. Do you see these symbols? Anybody recognize the symbols? Some of you in healthcare are probably wearing the symbols every single 
day. Watch this. Over time, over centuries, we as Christians, not pause. I'm not saying go to work and take your badge. That's demon worship thing. That don't do that. But what I'm saying is you can see the slow decay and apathy of what God-like worship is and what teachings are. How many of you guys knew that you were actually wearing the God symbol of the God of healing, a mythological God? Anybody? Okay, a couple of you guys are. But here's the danger of this. Many aren't, and that's the trick of the evil one. He's going to continue to bring in subtle and, and deceptive things into our life, just like this. And before we know it, we are misled by the evil one. And it's our job not to be misled. Our job is to know the truth. And when we know the truth, it'll set us what? It'll set us free. All right. So this is one possibility why he's saying that the, the that Satan, I know where Satan, where you live, and that's where Satan's throne is. But I would actually think it's probably the second more than the first. Zeus. Zeus is the most powerful and king of the mythological little g gods. He is the god above all gods. He is the ruler of everything. He's the most powerful god with inside um, these, this belief system out of all the other gods. Remember when Satan was in heaven, if you know the story. Satan was in heaven. He was one of the most beautiful creations and one of the most powerful creations God had ever created. Notice created. God was not created, but he actually created this being called Lucifer, an angel, which ended up happening. His pride, uh, Satan, Lucifer's pride, got the best of him. And he said, God, I want to be worshipped as highly and exalted as you are. And God did not, that did not sit well with God because God will not share his glory with anybody. God's glory is his glory and it's not yours, it's not mine to take from it. And Satan tried and there was a massive war in heaven which Satan lost and got kicked down to earth. And he now became and he desired to be the worshipped one. And he mythologically mess with people's mind by now he was the god potentially called Zeus the most powerful earthly god as worshiped today they built i mean this city the largest altar built to Zeus it was built in the ma- mountain and it was built like a huge what throne let me read this verse to you it says this revelation 2 verse 13 Jesus says i know where you dwell Satan's throne is there. Let me show you a picture of what um, it what must have looked like. This was um, Pergamum. And then notice right here, this was the throne. If you look very carefully, and let me show you a modern day depiction of it. And this is the throne. Can you imagine his <laughs> Zeus's butt sitting right here? And he is having his armrest on the throne. Do you see it? Do you see it? This is what they're talking about. And the worship of Zeus was right here on his throne. So most likely, if it's not the snake god or the healing god, it is most likely saying the most powerful Roman god in this belief system was located in what city? Pergamum. And this might be a possibility of it. So why is this important? Because once again, the worship of a non-real God was on the minds and the hearts of the church right there in Pergamum. Let's continue to read. Verse 12, he says to the church in Pergamum, write, the words of him, Jesus, who has the sharp double-edged sword, which is the what? Word of God. The word of God, Jesus himself is the word, and John, John chapter 1 talks about that Jesus was word, and he has always been, and he always has been, but in the middle of this, he came down to relate to us. I don't know about you, but isn't that pretty cool? Zeus never came down to earth, but God himself, through Jesus Christ, came down to earth and dwelt among us. Why? Because he wanted to relate to us. The next two words and the next two verses depict this. Again, we talked about this before. I know, Jesus says, I know means I can relate to where you're at. 
I can relate to your struggles. I can relate. I can relate. I can relate. Isn't that just, again, awesome and encouraging that we have a God that doesn't just sit on his heavenly throne and point fingers and cast lightning bolts? No, he is a God that has sit with us, loves us, cares for us, and can relate to us in everything, but he did not sin. But with inside of his grace, without sinning, he went to the cross to take your place and my place so that now you and I can have a relationship with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I don't know about you, but that is worthy of all praise and glory and honor. But in this city, there was some issues. But before we get to the issues, let's get to what they did good. Verse 13, I know where you dwell and where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast to my what? You hold fast to my name, and you have not denied my faith, even when Antipas was murdered. In other words, there was some murdering going on of Christians, but they held fast to the name of Jesus, and they did not deny the faith in Jesus Christ. So let's, let's put this into modern-day terms. It's simply this. They wore the T-shirt. They wore the cross necklace. They voted Christian. When they were interviewed, they said that they were Christian. Everybody knew in, in the city that they were Christian. They held firm to the name of Jesus, and they also held firm to the faith in Jesus Christ and what he did. Sounds awesome, right? Sounds awesome. And it sounds like many churches today. Many churches can I say, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus, and I have faith in Jesus, but they do not actually teach what Jesus taught. Let me say that again. They can say they believe in Jesus. They edify. They even sing some pretty doggone cool songs about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And also, they wear the T-shirt. They dress to the nines, or they don't dress to the nines. But bottom line is, they have faith in Jesus Christ and what he did. But what ends up happening in many churches, they can say Jesus. They can believe and have faith in Jesus, but they don't live like Jesus. You can say you're a Jesus follower, and you can even come to church. You can even come to Bible study. You can even come to small group. You can even read your Bible. You can even pray. But ladies and gentlemen, if we don't apply what the Word says according to God's Word, He's going to come right after us. So Catalyst Church, I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart, I'm going to continue to say this. You need to make sure that everything I say is the truth found in God's Word, not my feelings, not my opinions. Every time. Because when you do, iron sharpens iron. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So I want to encourage you from the very beginning, continue to make the name of Jesus known and continue to have faith in him. But if, ladies and gentlemen, you truly have faith in Jesus Christ, you really have faith in Jesus Christ and what his death, burial, and resurrection, you will actually follow him and his word above all else. And we're about to illustrate that in a few minutes because it's been prophesied about churches that, that don't. Matthew chapter 15, 7 through 9, it says this. You what? You hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you when you say, this people honors me with their lips? In other words, you're like, Jesus, 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 I have faith, I have faith, Jesus, 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 faith, Jesus, faith. You got the picture? All right. So they say... But their hearts are far from me. Why is their heart far from me? In vain, they do worship me, but they're teaching as sound doctrines the commands of men. Watch this. They proclaim Jesus with their lips, but they don't believe Jesus' teachings. They say that they have faith. They have faith in Jesus and faith of this, but they do not believe and live out Jesus' teachings which believes that's where we're at today, which happens so people can believe anything that what they want to in the world, but it's a slow fade into false teaching and false belief. That's why I'm making the declaration again, question everything I say, because I do not want to teach doctrines of men. I want to teach doctrines of God. And what is a doctrine? Here's a quick definition. A principle or position of the body or principles in a branch of knowledge or a system of belief. This is the beliefs of God's word, period, the end. Anything other than that is false teaching. And we're going to get to that in a few minutes. So these are some false teachings that have crept into Pergamum. Verse number 14. It says this. So you have faith. You've 
do, you put my name out there, you survive through the martyrism of Antipas, verse 14. But I have a few things against you. You have, what's the next word? You have some. Watch this. This is so important for us to understand. There are some bad apples in a bunch, right? And what happens, you all hear, if there's one bad apple in a bunch, it what's the entire bunch? Spoils the entire bunch. Ladies and gentlemen, here at Catalyst Church, we cannot have bad apples. And I don't want to be a bad apple. You don't want to be a bad apple. And we're going to give you some help at the end of this on how not to be a bad apple so that you're not misled. And it can be a theological bad apple. It could be a cultural bad apple. It could be a political bad apple. And we'll talk about that again in a second. But there's some of you that have done this. And pause. Here at Catalyst Church, um, because we strive our dead level best to preach the truth. Because we believe, again, the truth will set us free. There have been people that have come with false doctrines that have been inside of our church. And what's ended up happening is now they have left the church. And I'm, I, I love them. They, they were the one people. I'm not going to say names. They're, they're, um, they're people that have come to Catalyst Church that have been as excited and charismatic and loving and will give you the biggest hugs in the world. This is not just one. There's many. But when they're confronted with the truth, they can't handle the truth, and they've left. And we miss them, but not really. Why? Because they were a bad what? Apple. And I'm, I'm not being vindictive or angry or whatever, but watch this. We have to be careful because they were part of our family. And when they try to come back in, not through the doors, but through social media and to your ears, they're going to try to lead you astray from sound teaching. And that's what, again, I'm saying, question everything I say. And if you've got a question, let's talk about it. I would love to talk God's word with you. But we have to be careful of people who say they love Jesus and have faith in Jesus, but they are not sound teachers and are people and that's what it's saying here. Some of you hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before Israel so that they would sacrifice idol in idolatry and practice sexual immorality. Here's the quick story. Here's the quick story. Balaam was a compromised teacher of God, a prophet, a compromised. So Balak, the, the king of Moab, to you that doesn't make sense, but it would make sense. So Balak came to, the, to Balaam and said, can you please curse Israel? And Balaam was like, um, no. And then he's like, but here's a little bit of money. Um, no. Here's a little bit more. Um, no. And then all of a sudden, the price was right. Price was right. Balaam tried to curse Israel. Um, Israel, but God would not allow it to happen. In fact, you've heard about the donkey story, how the donkey talked to Balaam. That was that guy. All right. I don't know about you, but if you're talking to a donkey, God's trying to talk to you. All right. So that's me talking. To, I, I'll just leave that alone. Okay. So here's the deal. <laughs> oh, but here's the deal. God would not allow false teachings and curses to come upon his people. He just wouldn't. But Balaam went behind God's back, God knew everything, and told Balak, the king, this is how you can curse the people of Israel. You take the most attractive, let's just say Victoria's Secret models, and of, of, ba um, of, of your city, and put these Moabite women in front of these men. Allow them to Go with inside of them. Blend in. Let them be so attractive with the sole purpose that they will be enticed. The men will be enticed. And these women are permissive or allowed to go have sex with any person that wanted to have sex with them, especially if they're Israelites. Kind of looks, sounds like America, doesn't it, to you? The Victoria's Secret, the commercials, the Instagram pictures, whatever it might be. The subtle things. And, and what ended up happening over years was the following. The men of Israel started to have sexual relationships with all these women, which ultimately kids came from it, and ultimately marriages happened to it, and ultimately now they were eating and worshiping false gods. 
You see how that slow but steady approach of the evil one happened? Same thing happens to us. That's why we have to know the truth. And we need to know the tricks of the evil one. And we can be set free from the temptations of the evil one. And that's what he's saying. There's some of them in Pergamum. And I'm telling you right now, there might be some of you here at Catalyst Church, I don't know, that might be allowing the evil one to come in and trickle your mind into believing one thing, that it's okay. The second thing is the Nicolaitans. Some people were believing in the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans' teaching was the following. As long as your soul is okay, at then everything's okay. You can go ahead and sleep with anybody you want to, eat anything you want to. You can do any fleshly desires, your flesh, as long as your soul is okay with God. And what did you notice? So in Revelation 2, verse 15, we talked about this last week. And some of them are actually, the next verse talks about that Jesus himself in the church in Ephesus say, I hate, I hate, I hate, right here. Yet some of you, the church of Ephesus, I have hated the works of the Nicolaitans, but I also hate it as well. So hear me clearly. Your soul can be okay with Jesus Christ, but you got to live like it. you got to live like it. Because I will, here's a scary verse for some of you who are living in the flesh right now. Galatians chapter, Galatians chapter, where is that? Joe put it up on the screen. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. It says the following. The acts of the flesh are what? Obvious. obvious. It's obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Pause. Duh. Those are all bad, right? All these are sin, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's obvious, so we should all be shaking our head. Yes, right? Watch this. I warn you, like Jesus is warning the church, I warn you as I did before, and here again, I'm warning you again, Catalyst Church, and those who live, practice, and are living in it um, will, like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Listen to me closely. Just because, and this is what he's saying here, just because you proclaim the name of Jesus and have faith in the crucifixion and the resurrection does not mean that you are going to go to heaven. Because guess what? The devil believes it himself. The devil himself believes that Jesus is deity. And he also believes that Jesus died and rose again. And he doesn't have faith because he was there. But he's not going to live to honor God. This is where the rubber meets the road, church. You might say, and you probably have said, oops, I slipped up. Oops, I slipped up again. Oops, I slipped up again in sin. But hear me closely. If you are taking the grace of God and allowing yourself to do it over and over and over and over again, according to the verse, you probably are not saved. You probably aren't. Why? Because God's grace is good, but you cannot poop all over God's grace. You just can't. His grace is beautiful, perfect, and according to that and many other verses, if you think that you're okay to continue to sin like the Nicolaitans taught, oh, as long as your soul's okay, I can do whatever I want to. According to Jesus in the book of Eph- to, to the church in Ephesus, he says he hates that. But hear me clearly, he loves you. He loves you. He wants to extend grace into you. And if you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, your life should change completely change. So I'm going to attempt my dead level best to illustrate this the best way I can with an illustration. And by the way, as you know, I've said this before, illustrations aren't perfect. So there's some loopholes in this because they're finite things. So here we go. All right. So this container here filled with, filled with water is, is our belief system. All right. We all have beliefs, right? At childhood, our beliefs are pure. They really are. Kids just want to eat and drink and poop. That's all they want to do, right? That's all they want to do. And their belief system is, that's it. They're not confused about sexuality. They're not confused about politics. They're not confused about religion. They're not confused about anything else other than they need to eat, drink, and you know the word I just got finished saying. All right? So it's pure. 
But what ends up happening is we start growing up and we start um, learning a little bit. We have these right here are other beliefs that are not pure. For example, let's just say this belief. This belief, let's just say it's politics. This belief is, you know what, you need to believe and worship and to believe exactly the way the Republicans say or exactly the way the, the Democrats say or exactly the way this or this or whatever. And these views, what are we doing? We are taking our views of politics. We're taking our views of culture. We're taking our views from a political party, not from God's word. And what ends up happening, it's a slow drip into it. And slowly but surely, as you can tell, it starts penetrating into our life and starts changing our life, kind of like the, the God of healing. We are now wearing these God of healing logos all over us, and many of us have a slow fade into it. Let's just say, I'll just randomly choose this one. Let's just say this is education. Our education, you go to college and all of a sudden your belief system was one way, but you go to college and you start believing the professors, you start believing the hype, you start believing everything else, and then all of a sudden your belief in God, your belief in his creation, your belief in all this stuff is slowly but surely morphed into and messed up even more. And then you go into this one. Let's just say this one is social media. Isn't the internet always right? You laugh, but we believe everything on the internet, right? We believe that this person lied to this person, like this gossip here. So this is, this is online. This is our social media. And so little bit surely, you're believing some great, great things that ultimately, we've seen it before, that things posted online that ultimately it's a video or a post or something like this, and people get riled up and everything. And they're like, masks don't work, or masks do work, or politics of this, politics. and it's a, it's a commercial or a, a rally from like three years ago. But what do we do? We believe it. We add it to our belief system. And then let's just randomly choose this one. Let's just say this one's religion. You turn on TBN, you turn on the internet, and then all of a sudden, it's just a little, little bit of false teaching, a little bit of this, and you got this charismatic, like, not ugly man like me, but somebody else that is so enthusiastic, he might have a big smile on his face, he might have an afro, afro but most of the time they have skinny jeans, I'll just say that. Um, but all, <laughs> I can't wear skinny jeans, I'll, like, have a crease down my pants. But all, all of a sudden, you have all these beliefs. Here's a long story. And, this, and your belief with your parents. You're believing what your parents have to say. And your upbringing. Listen, bottom line is you can see right here, right there, that slowly but surely our belief systems are affected. And our childlike faith in our belief system and not having to believe technically anything is completely polluted. And that's what happened in the church of Pergamum. So little bit surely, there were some a little, some a little, some a little. Got the picture? Which resulted in, here we are 2,000 years later on, and we're still wearing the badge for the God of healing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for some help. Um, Joseph, I stand right here. Jacob, stand right here. Joe, stand right here for a sec. You go, stand over there. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> go. So as an illustration, let me make sure it's on the shot. Um, there you go. Can you get that cameraman? Okay. All right. So here's the deal. So scoot in a little bit, scoot in a little bit there, Joseph. So I want to illustrate this. So this is your belief system. Your belief. But what ends up happening if we're not careful is we now pass our belief system to other people. If we're not careful, and Joe... You're going to take that, not, by the way, don't drink this. There's iodine in it, so it'll kill you, okay? So, all right. <laughs> so will bad beliefs. It'll kill you. Mic drop. Okay, here we go. So, uh, so Joe might take his belief system, and he's going to share it with other people. You're going to take the belief system that you are believing and wherever it came from, and then slowly but surely you go from there. Then I need a little bit more help. To illustrate this, let's just say Melinda stand behind him, and then Jason stand behind him, and then Alan stand behind him. All right? 
here's yours, here's yours, and here's yours. Okay, so what ends up happening? You know it from your belief system, it passed your children, it passed your workplaces, it passed the social media, and what ends up happening? People are watching you. Watch. Wherever you're being discipled from and from who is what you're going to be discipled to be. Whoever you're being discipled from or from who you are going to be discipled by. There are people for centuries that are going to continue to believe what we believe if we're not careful. I want you to pour half of your cup into the person behind you. All right. And if there was an infinite amount of water, what's going to end up happening? 2,000 years, 3,000 years, 4,000 years, by just a little bit, ladies and gentlemen, just a little bit of false teaching, a little bit of culture, a little bit of politics, a little bit of what your mama taught you or your daddy taught you or whatever. We got to stop that, and we need to come to the Word of God, ladies and gentlemen, The word of God, as Jesus says, is all that matters. Because here's the deal. When you put the word of God as your filter, you put the word of God as what it says. It says that it, the word of God, is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates our heart and it changes us and equips us for things of righteousness sake. The things that these guys are holding in here is not righteous in any way. It's worldly. It's ungodly. And we've allowed that to come into your life, my life, and all of our lives. Why? Because we're not going to the Word of God, which results in the following. If I go to the Word of God, and then you pass the Word of God on, pass the Word of God on, and pass the word of God on. It changes everything. And when we allow the word of God to completely fill us, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to watch. The word of God purifies us from all of the unrighteousness in us. That is why I have preached every single week be in the word of God. Because I cannot come to your workplaces, I cannot come to your families and say, that's false teaching. That's not right. Ladies and gentlemen, you got to be clear and clean with what the Word of God says. If we're not careful, it will pollute us all. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the beauty of the Word of God, we can take religion or we can take politics and we can try to allow the politics to try to affect the Word of God and it cannot budge it. It is living and it is active and sharper than any double-edged sword. Would you guys take a seat, hold that drink, but do not drink it. Okay. In conclusion, I want to give you four quick ways where you can know and make sure that the Word of God is always in you so that you do not get compromised. Real quick, number one is be spirit-filled. Be spirit-filled. What simply means this. If you're a Jesus follower, if you believe that Jesus Christ came, died, and rose again, and you're living like it, not one of these, I believe in Jesus, I have faith in Jesus, I'm going to live in whatever life that I want to, by the way, you're probably not saved. But if you are spirit-filled, which means you will have, all I can say is kind of like a spider sense in you. When you're about to hear something, you're about to do something, you're about to post or believe something on Facebook, when we are spirit-filled, not spirit a little, but spirit what? filled. Let the whole Spirit of God be upon us. There will be a spider sense, just something inside of you that just says, it's just not right. Stop believing and start checking. Start checking. Let me read this to you. A person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit, All right, but considers them foolishness. And cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things. How much? How many things should, if we're Spirit-led? All things. We need to make judgment upon that. And to, that's, not, that's not shaking our fingers. It's for us shaking the fingers at ourselves and judging ourselves for what we're about to believe. The Spirit makes judgments about things. 
But such a person is not subject to mere human judgments for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to in, in, instruct him. But we have the mind of who? Christ. Christ. Not the mind of politics, not the mind of Catalyst Church, not the mind of Pastor Dave, not the mind of your parents, not the mind of your grandparents, the mind of who? Christ. And if we have the mind of Christ, we'll be spirit led. And that will help us not have false teachings and beliefs within inside of us. Number two, real quick, is be in the Word of God. How often? Daily. Daily. How on earth are you going to allow to know what is true unless you're allowing the Word of God to change you? Be in the Word of God daily. Daily. Be in the Word of God. The Bereans, as you're about to see here, the Bereans did not just believe anything that Paul and Silas was about to do. They didn't believe it. They went, and this is what it says. They went, they received the word. In other words, okay, let me learn. But all were eager to, that with eagerness, by examining the scriptures, how often? Daily, to see if these things were so. Ladies and gentlemen, before you make a post, before you believe a preacher, before you believe a, a cool little snippet online, go to the Word of God. And if you're in the Word of God daily, you will be able to post what is right, not your feelings or not anything else other than the mind of Christ, which probably would cause most of you to stop posting a lot. Number two. Number three is be accountable to others. Ladies and gentlemen, Accountability is a must with inside a church. If you're not a part of a small group, if you're not a part of mentorship, if you're not in, um, a part of accountability, you are going to be misled. Promise you that. But make sure those that you're accountable to give you the word of God, not their opinions. If they give your opinions, you better run away from those people who give you their opinions. But if they give you the word of God, and by the way, when they give you the word of God, you need to make sure that you always, always, always Fact check it every time. If I'm sitting down and discipling you, you better fact check it. Does that mean that there will be a lot of extra work on your end? Absolutely. But might as well do the work now than to have generations and generations and generations polluted by your nonsense that is not from God's word. Then the last one is simply this. Be fat. Be fat. Already there, but... I'm talking about spiritually. Be faithful, be available, be teachable. Be faithful, be available, be teachable. Be faithful to the God's word. Like it said in Pergamum, continue to be faithful to God. But don't stop there. Be available. Say, Spirit of God, please teach me. How can I grow more? How can I grow more? How can I grow more? Be available to be a part of small groups. Be available to be here in person or online. But when you're here and I preach, what should you go do? Check it. Make sure what I'm preaching is correct by bringing your own Bible or checking it on your own. And by the way, don't check it on YouTube. Don't check it by another preacher. Check it yourself by the Word of God which results in being teachable. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you right now, many of you say, you know what, I've been a Christian for a while, I know about the Bible, and so on and so forth. You arrogant hypocrite. Listen to me. How do you know that what you learned in Sunday school many years ago that you've been believing along the way is correct? Be teachable. Take that humility and say, there's a possibility what I learned back in the day or I learned last week or I learned on YouTube potentially could be wrong. Be willing to humble yourself and allow God's word to teach you. And when you are, you'll be fat, spirit-filled, checking God's word daily and accountable to the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Let's not allow false teaching in your life, my life. Let's not allow the world to change us but let God change us one day at a time. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you that in the middle of Revelation, there's a church, like many churches in America, that have allowed some people to come in, but God, you are not okay with that. Your teaching and your teaching alone changes everything. And may we not, may we stop with 
us. May it stop with us so that our children, our grandchildren, those online, those who are in workplaces, those who we come in contact with, that we tell them the word of God, not our opinions, the word of God, not politics, the word of God, not our feelings, whatever it might be. God, please, may it start and stop with us. And the result of that is the word of God is going to penetrate our heart, our children's hearts, our workplaces heart, and everybody else. Does it take work? Yes. But the work is beneficial because the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates our heart, teaching us what is right to do. And Lord Jesus, may this just not be another read your Bible message. May this be a life change message, recognizing, Jesus, that because of your grace, because of your mercy, we can be children of you. Not by polluting your grace, but stepping into your grace. And if we know your grace, it will set us free and may it drive us to our knees, recognizing that what we have believed before might not be true. Let your word penetrate our hearts. So God, in conclusion, we're going to worship you with a song about belief. As a declaration, Lord, we're going to sing this. Whether we know the words or not, but when we are about to say or sing the words of what we believe. May we shout it out as a declaration that says, I really believe this. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Let's all stand.